Kids Comics Unite is a friendly, free community of children's graphic novel creators who are serious about improving their work and building their careers. This month, we're excited to highlight some of our members' crowdfunding campaigns as part of our partnership with Crowdfunder.com. Our very own Patrick Lugo will be hosting these streams. Patrick, take it away! Hello, welcome to uh, our first Saturday afternoon live stream here at the Kids Comics Unite YouTube channel. Um, uh, excited to be uh, seeing so many people joining us. So that's really uh, fun for me. And our special guest is also a fun one. So before I spend any more time uh, just rambling, let me start with a really delightful video that, that our guest has uh, provided. Uh, it'll give us all the information. Uh, it'll, it'll make for a great introduction. So let me just play that now. Hey everyone, how's it going? Ken Lamug here, author and illustrator. Kamusta na po mga kababayan? And thanks for checking out the crowdfunding campaign for Petro book number two. So the story of Petro is about this boy who would often get into trouble because of his laziness. He tried to do a specific task, but he'd try to do a shortcut and he would dig himself deeper into problems. But through his curiosity, his ingenuity, creativity, and sometimes the kindness of his heart, he's able to find ways out of these problems and at the same time, helping those people around him. Ever since I was a child, I've always wanted to create my own story that's based on the Filipino culture. Petro's world is magical and filled with many creatures and characters from Filipino folk tales and mythologies. And these are the same stories that I grew up in, and I always wanted to share them with the world. The choice of making Petro a wordless graphic novel was a conscious one. I wanted the reader to sit and pause at each picture and really be immersed and absorb the world in every page and illustration that they're in. I've received a lot of positive feedback from teachers who use the Petro books as a text for hesitant readers. In 2020, Petro and the Fleeking was actually selected to represent Nevada at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, we were all stuck at home in 2020, but it was still a great honor to be selected to be able to share the story of Petro and the Filipino culture to the world. So thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Please read the campaign description below. Check out some of the rewards. Maybe something in there resonates with you. I hope that you share this campaign with your friends and I hope that you join us on the Petro book number two adventure. Thank you so much. See you soon. And we're back. Hey. <laughs> so, Ken, welcome. Welcome to the Kids Comics live stream. Hi, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Thanks we have for a, having we have me. A, yeah, yeah. We're so excited. Um, I just want to really quickly do uh, this bit right here, right? Because this is the... Yes. The link to your crowdfunding campaign, which is fully funded from last I heard. Is this true? Yep. I just checked and we're 137% from our goal. So that's that's awesome. That's a big. <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's yeah. excellent. How many more yeah. days do you have? You still have a while yet. So I still have about 14 days left. So I actually started this a little bit late, like 24 days into uh, into the, the campaign or the the promotion, you know, for um, crowdfunder. So I didn't do the full 30 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that doesn't seem to be uh, working against you at the moment. Yeah, it's it all worked out so far. It's it's been going well. And, um, you know, I, I just got to keep pu pushing through and uh, keep spreading the word. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's what we're kind of doing here at Kids Comics Unite. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Kids Comics Unite is the the channel that brought us all together and is working in partnership with Crowdfunder. But um, before we take a detailed dive into your campaign, I was wondering if you might be able to do a little bit more of an overview. I mean, we got a nice little introduction via the video, but still, let's let's make it personal, Ken. So I was yeah. wondering if you could give the the folks here in YouTube land. Uh, like uh, your secret, your not so secret origin, I guess I should say. Yeah, this is um, I. So this is probably going to be useful for, especially for some of you out there who are um, presenting at schools, 
you know, talking about comics, talking about your books. This is actually what this mini presentation is about. And but I'll share it with you guys because it, it kind of covers my origin story, basically. So let me go ahead and I should do a screen share here. All right. So you guys can see that it's popping up right now. Boom. Right. There it is. Okay. So like I said, this is something you can take whatever you, you want from this. This is a presentation that I use uh, when I go to schools and present to kids. So it's kind of geared mostly for kids. I've made it uh, very visually interesting um, and I kind of have a story to go with it. So typically when we're presenting our origin story, you know, like what information do I select from my life that would be relevant uh, to kids and to the audience. So I try to kind of make an arc out of this. Um, so let's go ahead. So yeah, I introduce myself. My name is Ken. I'm an author and illustrator and I talk about um, making picture books, graphic novels, and comics. And uh, cool tip, if you have pets, they are fun with kids. They love pets. <laughs> so I, I have my two pets, Moose and Chloe, who are uh, very much um, motivating me to get out and, you know, take them for a walk. And they're very entertaining and good, very good stress reliever. And here's a photo of my family. And uh, I have three boys and my wonderful wife who's been there from the very beginning. And uh, this is a photo that uh, was taken at the High Roller here at, in Las Vegas, which is that uh, that big kind of like a Ferris wheel where you go into this the balls. And um, it's I think it's like, uh, about like half an hour or an hour to go around the entire, uh, the entire uh, High Roller. And so the photo, the fun, funny thing is that there's uh, aliens in there. So I present it to kids. I tell them like, do you guys remember when the aliens came here to, <laughs> to Las Vegas and they invaded Las Vegas? And the funny thing is some of the kids are like, yeah, I rem totally remember that. And they really get into it. And so I, I kind of like make fun of the other kids that don't remember it. I'm telling them like, you know, the ones that uh, that don't remember it, I'm pretty sure you guys got uh, got brainwashed by the aliens, and uh, you know we get like a big laugh out of that. And so I start introducing again some of my books. I like I said, I make picture books, uh, graphic novels, and uh, comics. And I actually started my illustration uh, style with kind of like an Edward Gorey, very like dark, more adult oriented. And those are my books here, kind of towards to. Uh, to the right, so the stumps of Flat Top Hill, which is uh, a girl that goes into a haunted house, and also AIDS for asteroids, Z's for zombies, which is kind of like an alphabetical end of the world <laughs> for each letter of the alphabet. And then I, so I had to transition my style from creating these more dark parody uh, adult type of content to more children specific. So I had a change there. And another one that I was super proud of is when I created the library card for the Las Vegas Library District. So this is really cool because, you know, when you show this library card to people around town, they recognize it right away. And you're like, yeah, I, I you know, I created that art. So that's that's pretty nice. And again, the uh, Petro and the Flea King, which is actually uh, the, or, the uh, first book for the Petro series. And we're crowdfunding the second book right now. So the first book is one that was selected to represent Nevada at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. And again, this this whole project started off as a, a passion project and uh, something that I just did because I wanted to be able to tell the story of Petro. And so I go into how I became an author and illustrator. And for me, it all started back when I was a kid. Right. Being being a kid, there wasn't anything special about me except for that I like to use my imagination. So I talk about how I imagined myself writing robots when I was a kid a lot with my friends. And I would, because my dad was a um, electrical engineer. So I'd, he'd always be working on, you know, electronic stuff. <laughs> and I imagined that he was building a robot for me and my friends. So it was one of those things that we would pretend, kind of pretend play. I also imagined that I was a world travel, traveler, adventure, kind of like Indiana Jones. And also like a ghost hunter. There was this school um, that I went to back in the Philippines where we had a basement. So the school was a Catholic school and there was a basement. And me and my friends would go into this basement. It was really dark all the time. And we would um, 
kind of just fool around and pretend that we were fighting ghosts. But oftentimes, we would just get in trouble getting caught by the teachers. And there was obviously nothing there. But, you know, growing up in a very, um, I guess, the, the culture of the Philippines, it revolves around a lot of mythology, a lot of creatures, monsters, and things like that. So we were kind of brought up in a superstitious kind of culture. So oftentimes, you would, you know, try to imagine all these different creatures that, that would be around the neighborhood or, you know, even in the basement. And again, kind of like Tarzan, I pretended I was Tarzan <laughs> jumping from tree to tree. Or I would pretend that uh, I was a super baby, kind of like Superman or uh, Goku crash landing from another planet and, you know, saving, uh, saving people, rescuing people. And so, like I said, for me, I started back in the Philippines. That's where I, I was born and raised, uh, primarily in the main city of Manila and the neighboring city called Quezon City. And interesting thing about the Philippines is that we have over 7,000 different islands, 170 different languages, and we have the fourth largest shopping mall in the world. And this always gets a crack from the parents uh, when I present this at school because, you know, it's all about shopping. So I tell them, like, all the different things you can buy and you have to get on a tram to go from building to building at these malls because they're so big. And then my family moved to the U.S. when I was about 17 years old for you know, finding better opportunities, a better life. But growing up in the Philippines, I was pretty shy. I didn't have a lot of friends. And so I spent most of my time at the library reading books. And that's when I would start to draw the things that I would be reading or video games that I would be watching. So I was really into um, folk tales, mythology. I was reading a lot of like National Geographic, um, almanacs, things like that, things that you you know, kind of like a Wikipedia, right? But back then, um, I would just read this from the library or my dad, I remember he bought a, a set of encyclopedia, but it was missing a whole bunch of letters. <laughs> so I was just reading a lot of those things and I really got into the facts and trivias and things like that. And so that's when I realized that you could be car a cartoonist. And back then, comics were expensive. So I was really reading mostly uh, comics strips from uh, the Sunday newspapers. And then so I would start drawing all these different things that I was imagining. And I had paper everywhere with all my drawings, right? And we had a, uh, a copy machine. So the, ha the house that we were living in, the, the, the front of the house was a store. And we, we ran that store. And that changed from, you know, selling knickknacks to at one point we had a, a copy machine in there. And in front of our house was a school. Or, and in front of the store was a school. So the kids would always go to the store making photocopies and that copy machine would break all the time. And so we had just a bunch of paper left over and I would make, um, gra gra grab all those paper that were just you know um, useless basically and I would start turning those into comics. And so this is around the time when um, I introduced this character. So this character is kind of based on a real person, but for the purpose of presenting to kids, I totally fictionalized the character and I call him Mr. Meanie. And you can see he's kind of a hybrid of, <laughs> of SpongeBob and Wario. So the kids will recognize this and they'll start laughing, you know. And then so when I introduced Mr. Meanie, I'm like, so what do you guys think Mr. Meanie did to all my drawings? Because Mr. Meanie is the person who doesn't support you in what you do, right? And so we get some guesses and some of the kids will get it. And I tell them, yeah, basically Mr. Meanie took all of my drawings and burned it. And so, and this... Guys, this really happened, but I'm not going to say who Mr. Meanie is because I don't want to get in trouble, right? But all my all my drawings really got burned. And so I was pretty much, um, I was distraught at this point. And I kind of stopped drawing, right? So I basically said, I'm not going to draw anymore because if somebody can just take all your drawings and, you know, destroy them, burn them, do whatever, and I'm just going to say I quit, right? And this was around the time when my family moved from the city to the countryside of the Philippines. And my dad had this idea of um, getting us pets around the house, which basically when he said pets, it was just a bunch of chickens, ducks, and turkeys. And it was up to myself and my brother and sister to take care of these animals. And so that's a, a, an old photo of um, kind of our backyard. And you can see we have some of the ducks there, some of the chickens, turkeys, that kind of thing. 
And then my dad had another idea because he's very entrepreneurial, right? So he, he was watching this video and he saw this guy um, making money by selling honey. So he said, we're going to get into the beekeeping business. And so it was up to me to be in charge of these bees. <laughs> and it was cool at first. We got this really clear uh, beehive. So you can see how the bees are, um, are moving around in there. You can see the queen. It was transparent. I think it was made out of plexiglass. And then eventually we got the big white boxes where the, uh, the official beehives were. So this is um, the guy's house, the guy that was selling us the beehives and all those boxes in the back are the actual hives. So we got four of those hives. And as you know, when you're taking care of bees, you get stung. So um, I got stung basically everywhere, right? And at that point, I was like, I don't really want to do any of this stuff anymore. And something else happened to the bees, something bad. So it kind of worked out for me in a way because I that was like a way of not taking care of the bees anymore. <laughs> but it was sad for the bees. We had a big flood and the beehives got flooded in our backyard. So, And at that point, I was like, okay, I want to get into something else. And that's how I eventually got into computers, which is kind of what I do now, right, for my work. Um, I learned how to do computer coding. And this was back 90s, so we did, didn't even have internet. The internet that we had was... Um, was really slow. You had to do a command prompt to get to the internet and it was all text-based. There wasn't any web browsers back then, but I wanted to learn how to do computer programming. That was really interesting to me. And so that's how I kind of got into what I do now for my work, which is uh, computer programming. I do web design, I do video editing, basically a lot of little, little things that computer related, I kind of know enough to get in trouble, right? So that's, so that's kind of what I've been doing. And everything has been working great, but as an adult, deep down inside, I still had that desire that I wanted to be creative. Like I wanted to still be able to one day share my stories, share the story of my culture, create my own stories, all these different things. And I did, really didn't know how to approach that. And it was only after uh, I met a good friend of mine. His name is Tom. And Tom was, uh, his background was into video production, uh, working on TV stations. And so we started talking about making movies. And I don't know exactly how it happened, but we started writing our own scripts. And I wanted to learn all the technical side of, uh, of working in movies. So I had to work the camera, work lighting, and also write a story and work with actors, finding a set, set decoration, all these different things. So that getting into that situation kind of sparked, you know, that fire that was you know, tampered back uh, deep down inside and really got me into being creative again and looking at things in a different light. And so I started to get back into creating my own stories. But as I've told you guys, it's been a while. Now. I've stopped drawing. So I had to really teach myself how to draw again. And this was about 11 years or so now. So that's kind of around the time when I was really into the Edward Gorey, you know, pen uh, cross hatching style of illustration. And so I had to teach myself how to do that. And eventually I tried to adapt my style more into the kid lit type of um, illustrations and I had to change everything basically. And so this is about the time when I tell the kids, you know, like Mr. Meanie always shows up, right? Even as an adult, Mr. Meanie is always going to be there. He's going to sow doubt and fear, making you, you know, not trust your instincts and say what you're working on is not any good at all. And really, you have to work hard to push Mr. Meanie away and focus on your work, trust the process, believe in yourself. And so things started to change for me when I started to show my work to other people, either by posting it online, finding your tribe, being with, you know, kids comics and sharing your work. And that's how you kind of elevate yourself. You gain more confidence confidence and you realize that, hey, maybe what I'm working on is really not all that bad as what Mr. Meany keeps saying, right? Because some people like it, they encourage you and they say, hey, we really like what you're doing. Can you create more? And the more you do this, the more people will want to encourage you and the more you'll get, um, you're basically planting the seeds. And then that's when opportunities show up. So for me, that's kind of how it all started. I just planted the seeds, even doing free stuff for a lot of publications and things like that. And um, people reach out to you. Hey, we like this idea for what you've illustrated. Do you want to work on a project with us? Do you want to work on a book with us? And those things become actual paid work. 
Um, and then that's how you get better. And that's how you start working on actual big projects. And so that's kind of how it, it all started for me. And um, that's where I am today. I, <laughs> I just kept doing that over and over. Trust the process. You're going to have ups and downs. Um, but as long as you keep plugging away, you know, you're going to eventually get to, to that point that you want to reach. So that's, that's kind of um, what I present to kids. Obviously, I'm way more animated when I'm presenting to kids. Um, yeah, and you're not like a little tiny box in the corner. That was such a great uh, thing to see. <laughs> I mean, Ken, your art looks just so effortless the way that whole presentation was. I can just imagine kids being swept up into that world. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're not um, talking to a little bit more of the, the middle graders. The middle graders are just like, they don't care. They're too cool for school. <laughs> but the the uh, the younger kids, they're, they're really into it. And um, yeah, there's a few things that I, I mentioned. So when I talk about like getting into computers, uh, uh, I start talking to kids, right? Like who here likes computers? And then they're like, yeah, we love computers, right? It's like, who here loves uh, playing video games? Like, yeah, we love video games. And you start naming the games that they like, they're into, right? Like, Fortnite, all these different games. And the more you like name the games, the more they get amped up. <laughs> and then you're like, so who here loves uh, YouTube? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I love YouTube. You know, like who here are YouTubers? I'm a YouTuber. Everybody's a YouTuber now, right? <laughs> and How so would you like, like to review my comic? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I kind of get them in trouble. I'm like, all right, teachers, make sure to take the names down because you know you guys are way too young to be on YouTube. And then they're like, oh, oh you know, they're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> All so that credibility you've built out the window, right? Yeah. So it's it's pretty funny. They they really get into it. So that's you know, and that kind of you know, all these different things that you're working on. When you actually talk to the kids that you're create kind of creating these for, and you're like, man, it's totally worth it. You know, like they're they're finding entertainment, they're enjoying your drawings, your stories, and you're inspiring them. You know, so it's like, wow, this is this is what it's about, right? <laughs> so. Oh yeah, I mean this is that 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 communication, and then now you're kind of communicating stuff that's more from your your own roots, right? The the, the mythology and the Filipino um, folklore that's yeah. informing more of your recent projects versus, say, the Victorian Edward Gorey, which <laughs> right, which yeah, I I too was a fan of when I was young, right? But we all yeah. kind of start with something and then we we go our own way, but um. I don't know. I, I say there's there's a certain um, there's still going to be those kids that will prefer, you know, the Wednesday Adams and 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 right. that kind of vibe. You know, the I've I've had parents um, buy those type of uh, books that I've had I've created for their kids, and then I I keep telling them like, okay, this might scare your child, <laughs> so I'll get a message later like, yeah she couldn't sleep you know, like after she read that that story so like yeah i told you um but but you know they the parents really get into it i think it maybe it's partly nostalgia they've kind of grew up with that style so when they read it like oh i kind of remember something similar to this that you know i read and um and they like it so you know i i still love it and when the opportunity arises for me to do something like that i'll, I'll jump on it again um but yeah it was it was a shift from for me personally shifting styles from because you know you know publishing right once you get kind of typecasted into a certain style that's all they see okay he does that illustration style that's what he's known for so i had to kind of push that back in a way and redo my entire portfolio to switch to the kidlit side so it was and you know I, it's it's become a challenge but I've, I've been able to do it so yeah Clearly, clearly. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Um, well, first, let's let's just uh, get this message in there. Ken, you're awesome and inspiring. So clearly, <laughs> you're on the right track. Yeah. And then Lisa, hi, Lisa. She wants hi. to know, how long did it take for you to get comfortable doing presentations? You know, do you still get nervous? Uh, yeah. I, I, so it's kind of like um, you guys are familiar with this, kind of like riding a bicycle or, you know, getting or creating drawings and things like that. If you don't do it after a certain amount of time, all of a sudden everything is like, like back at square one. So like, OK, whew, you know, breathe, train your breathing, try to get back into it. But for me, I think what really helped was just re repetition, just 
Um, so when I first started doing the presentations, I did it at a local bookstore and I was really bad. Um, I didn't have it as organized as I do now. Um, but what I did was I, I revised the presentation several times, but the key for me was just practicing and rehearsing. So I would be in the car driving to work and I would be like just repeating it over and over, repeating my lines over and over. So when I got to the actual presentation, everything would just flow and, and I would stop breaking and doing the ums and all these different things. And, you know, I, I would kind of get my jokes in all these different things. So it was a lot of repetition. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the key point for me, but, uh, I really try to improve this each time by adding new things and seeing how the kids react. So that's almost like stand up, I think. <laughs> okay. So then what was the newest thing you added for us kids today? Oh, for, <laughs> I, I didn't change anything for today. No. <laughs> so I actually, um, last one that I presented was a couple of weeks ago at a library and it was for the summer reading program. Um, and so I presented the same thing, but I added more stories into it. So when I show a slide, I, you kind of have to gauge and see from the, you know, from the audience and kind of read it and see if they're interested at something, then you can expand on it more, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Well, today we're interested in your uh, crowdfunder project, right? Petro. Yeah. So I want to, I want to, you know, zoom into some of uh, what you've got going on there. But I figure the first way we could do that right here as we're approaching the coming close to the 30 minute mark, I'm going to play your campaign video one more time for anyone who kind of rolled in late. Um, and then as soon as that video is done, we can just jump right into actually taking a look at your campaign and really uh, get a sense of like what it is you're putting out there for this summer spotlight. Sure. So the first thing I want to do, however, is uh, drop that bit of information which is always helpful to anyone who's uh who's coming along and then i'm gonna press play hey everyone how's it this. going ken lamug here author and illustrator Kamusta na po mga kababayan? and thanks for checking out the crowdfunding campaign for petro book number two so the story of petro is about this boy who would often get into trouble because of his laziness he tried to do a specific task but he'd try to do a shortcut and he would dig himself deeper into problems. But through his curiosity, his ingenuity, creativity, and sometimes the kindness of his heart, he's able to find ways out of these problems and at the same time, helping those people around him. Ever since I was a child, I've always wanted to create my own story that's based on the Filipino culture. Petro's world is magical and filled with many creatures and characters from Filipino folk tales and mythologies. And these are the same stories that I grew up in, and I always wanted to share them with the world. The choice of making Petro a wordless graphic novel was a conscious one. I wanted the reader to sit and pause at each picture and really be immersed and absorb the world in every page and illustration that they're in. I've received a lot of positive feedback from teachers who use the Petro books as a text for hesitant readers. In 2020, Petro and the Fleeking was actually selected to represent Nevada at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, we were all stuck at home in 2020, but it was still a great honor to be selected to be able to share the story of Petro and the Filipino culture to the world. So thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Please read the campaign description below. Check out some of the rewards. Maybe something in there resonates with you. I hope that you share this campaign with your friends and I hope that you join us on the Petro book number two adventure. Thank you so much. See you soon. Awesome. Who's that guy? He's so good. I know. <laughs> Looking good now. I would, and, and here we are at the page um, with you residing at a nice 137%. Yeah. It, percent. I think we got one throughout this presentation. So that's cool. I believe it. I mean, look at some of these responses that are that are coming into the comments. Like, such an inspiring story, Ken, especially for an introvert. So excited to see more Filipino mythology stories from you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> I recognize that icon. That's very yeah, hilarious. right. <laughs> Unmistakable. And then also we have another. Um, Ashley and Jeff want to know what kind of opportunities, tips would you give artists looking to get their work out there? Uh, what kind of tips? So 
when I was first starting, I was lucky enough that uh, there was this online magazine. What was it called? Um, I have to look it up. But the online magazine was focused on um, horror stories, but it was kid lit, like for kids, right? So it had fantasy, uh, folk tales, horror that was combined with it. And so they were looking for illustrators uh, to illustrate the stories that, because uh, it's, it's, I think it was more of like an anthology. So authors, uh, writers, and illustrators were creating uh, this magazine and they were just kind of, you know, writing a story and then an illustrator would come in and illustrate the story and they would publish these mag magazine on a quarterly basis. And it was all online and it was free, basically. And so I saw this and um, I was able to get in and illustrate some of the, the stories in there. And luckily enough, one of the editors for the magazine, eventually she became an agent. And since I was consistent in my illustration and I was always on time, I was prompted with my submissions, uh, she saw the potential and encouraged me to submit to her agency. And so that's kind of how everything got started for me on the publishing space. And so that was a big step. So really it was contributing, participating. So even even if I see like um, uh, an anthology for a local comic book group, hey, we're putting together a, an anthology. We've got this particular story. We need some illustrators to do it. I would I would get in on there because number one, it it's good practice for me to participate in those kinds of events. Number two, I love supporting um, local groups, especially because the scene here in, in Las Vegas, it's not that big. So being able to participate, I feel like, it encourages other people to step up and kind of, you know, creates that culture. So, or builds that culture. So anything like that, any opportunity that shows up, even if it's technically free, I don't get paid or anything. I'll, I'll try to put my, you know, my name in the hat. And so again, that's kind of how you plant the seeds, right? You're creating relationships, you're planting the seeds and um, you're also improving yourself and getting better in what you do. And you never know what kind of opportunity will, will, will come from it. So. That's, you know, that's what I try to get into. Agreed. And look at this. Uh, super inspiring, especially if you've had a Mr. Meanie of your own, nearly snuff out your dreams. <laughs> I'm so glad you got back to making your art and can't wait to read your new book. Thank Thanks, you. <laughs> so that. This, yeah. This, and this, Mr. Meanie is kind of universal. So. <laughs> yes, Mr. Meanie. Coming, coming to what an art studio near you? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I have to give credit. So, Mr. Meany, um, even though I added him in there, miss the idea for Mr. Meany actually came from a very first presentation that I did, because um, I was I was having the kids create their own characters, right? So one of the kids created Mr. Meany, and it didn't look like this character here, but you know, like. They, they started, I had them draw the characters and I had them talk about the characters and I had a mic on them too. So that's kind of, that's kind of like where the idea came from. I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. How can I, I can incorporate Mr. Meanie into my, into my story? Because Mr. Meanie is kind of a universal type of character. And so, you know, that wasn't even an original character now that I think about it. It was from, you know, one of our, one of the readers. So yeah, it, it worked out. <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. What would you, what we'd call that almost like a what crowdsourced character maybe? <laughs> Crowds, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but uh, here, let's 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 take a look at uh at Petro. So look at these well, look at these little bits of artwork. Is there anything uh you'd yeah, like so to? Yeah, so for for this one, um, like I said, this was uh this this is a crowdfund for book number two. And so when the idea for uh, doing a crowdfunder came up, this is the first one that came to mind. But I didn't really have a lot of time and resources to, to generate new art for it. I was able to create, I think, a couple of pieces of new art. But everything else was just um, used from the previous book. So it, it worked out. And, uh, you know, I really like the illustration from the previous book anyways and the new book is going to be very similar in style so that's kind of my strategy when i went into this i'm like okay i'm just gonna 
used some original art in here. I'm not going to stress out about this because because <laughs> my first uh, crowdfunder was, I don't know, seven years ago. And that was very stressful. So I really made it to a point this time around to not stress out about this. I'm like, okay, I'm going to put this out there and we'll see how the world reacts to it. If they like it, then they like it. If not, maybe I'll do it, but it, it'll just be pushed a little bit later, you know? I mean, clearly, I mean, this artwork is just gorgeous. And then you made the decision to um to go with a silent graphic novel. Talk about a bold step. Can you uh, elaborate on on that particular decision? Sure. So one of the reasons why I decided to create it uh, as a silent graphic novel, I really wanted to make this into a Tagalog, like a Filipino um, worded graphic novel. But then I knew there would be barriers for readers because you, you wouldn't be able to read it you know most of the audience at least here in the us would be um, in english and i didn't want to do that and so i decided you, you know what i will approach this with just all illustrations i'm gonna just illustrate it as much as need it needs to be to convey the message that i want to to say so some panels where you could you would normally just have one panel and the character saying something i would have to draw that in a couple of pages right two, three pages just to convey that emotion that the, the words could easily have said in one panel. And so, um, but at the same time, it, I think it, it, it helped it because it allowed the reader to kind of sit down right on, on the pictures and really take it in and visually read it instead of just reading the words. Kids nowadays will read a 250 page graphic novel in like, 10, 15 minutes, right? I, I go to a bookstore and my kids be like, oh, this is really cool. And by the time we're out, I'm like, I already finished this book. I'm like, what? <laughs> but you still want to buy it, <laughs> right? So like, they just kind of almost skim through it. It's so fast. And so I think, especially with like my Mischief and Mayhem graphic novels, those are, you know, 250 pages. They're all, they're all so action packed. It moves so fast. Um, so I feel like for Petro, I kind of want the reader to, to really pause. And that's why when you have a lot of details in your illustrations, this is for me, right? I don't know if readers approach it the same way. When there's a lot of details, I want to sit down on that place, on that illustration, on that drawing, and really just kind of take it in and see like, oh, look at these lines. Look at all the, you know, the little details in here. And I think I, I tend to appreciate those kinds of illustrations more. And um, that's kind of what I was trying to do here. So you know, just take a little bit of moment and take take the pictures in and appreciate it more. So that's that's what I'm hoping for, at least. Isn't that interesting? Like, you know, when talking about like sequential art in particular, right? Like we know like illustration, you can have an illustration tell a story. But when you talk about sequential art, right, there's usually that whole dynamic of, you know, the two pieces of artwork have to work together, right, to tell, convey, to convey a story or a meaning. But I've always found it interesting that once you start adding dialogue, right, people will read the story at the pace of the dialogue. Yeah. But once you remove the dialogue, then it's kind of like there's no there's no timer, there's no ticker, right? People people <laughs> right. are like, you know, people might fall in on one page or people might just gloss over it. Yeah, yeah. That is that is very interesting. Especially when um when you have I think what happens is when you're reading a, a graphic novel or a comic, the characters and the environment is already registered inside your brain, right? So now you kind of know what the characters look like. You kind of know where they're at. So now you're just skimming through the words and getting on with the story. And, you know, the words or the images kind of become like a background to the words in a way. And so I think that with a wordless graphic novel like this, you're in a way you're forcing the reader to understand what's happening on that panel, you know? So like, Hey, I'm not going to tell you what they're doing. You gotta, you gotta figure it out yourself. <laughs> but at the same time, that puts on the challenge to the artist to really make that illustration um, legible so that the reader is able to comprehend, you know, especially something like this where it's very, cartoonish in a way, right? It's not realistic. So I don't know if that's a, a positive or a negative because I guess everything would be more, would have to be more um, visually uh, animated so that 
the emotions can come through or can be conveyed. But at the same time, you don't have the intricacies of like a, an eyeball that's kind of sad, you know, like everything would have to be exaggerated, right? If you want to convey a sad moment. Um, and right, so that, go on. That's such an interesting thing in that, um, especially when you're cartooning, right? Like a lot of what's internal can be put on the outside, you know, yeah. you can really emphasize that frown or that smile, you know, you can move the features around a lot more than if it was uh, like a, perfectly rendered version of Superman that looks exactly like Christopher Reeve, right? You yeah. better be good at drawing those those expressions. Right. Yeah, all the little details become important. Right, so. whereas here, I mean, look at that. You can just convey so much, you know, working with body language, with silhouettes, with pacing and, and texture. I mean, it's just black and white and one single color that you're using here. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to really, a, a big inspiration for this is um, uh, Matthew Forsythe's books, uh, Jin Chalo and Ojin Gogo, I think is what it's called. And those are in, in a similar style. So they're, they're uh, he does uh, picture books and graphic novels. I think he might also be into animation. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of his inspiration from that came from the Korean culture. So when he illustrated his, his books. And so that that was a big inspiration for me. And again, going back to the Edward Gorey style of illustration where it's just, you know, um, just pen and ink, basic, pen and paper, basically, and just, buy, you know, duo tone. And um, I tried to create some texture with the, uh, the, the hues. And I, I think I'm planning on doing the same thing for the second book as well. But yeah, it's just, uh, this, this is positive in a way where I get back to my roots of just drawing with... Um, with ink and, and paper, which is a lot of fun for me. So. so are you actually putting ink on paper or these actual physical pieces of um, artwork or are you working in a digital? No, not for, not for this one. Um, I used to do it for the original ones, but it's it just takes a lot of more time to do. So I tried to streamline my process, which is why I kind of switched to digital. Um, but yeah, replicating that look for me is 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 really fun. Oh, I mean, you and you, you've done a, you've clearly done a great job of it. Um, and, you know, the thing with working on paper is that that adds up, right? You end up with piles and piles of paper and yeah. wouldn't want to accidentally summon another Mr. Meanie in that case. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But look at this. That's I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven endorsements from uh a number of uh, really impressive looking logos. But yeah. And, and a lot of these, um, you know, when you're, cre so when I created this originally, I wasn't sure if it was going to be picked up um, traditionally, but I always, one thing that I really lo love about the, um, the comic book uh, community is that it's a very um, self-sufficient, very, you know, do it yourself uh, type of attitude so especially coming from this the group here in town that i live in and everybody just kind of self-publishes right and so that was kind of a plan b for me was to just if, if it does if it doesn't get picked up by a traditional publisher no big deal i'm going to self-publish this because i i need to get this out into the world and so um in that regard i had to take the initiative and try to uh, promote it, get it into you know a few awards, that kind of thing, and so that that's kind of what inspired me to to submit it to you know, all these different uh, organizations, try to get recognition for it. That's amazing, and that's like a whole that's like a whole tertiary skill set to be able to just be on that calendar and you know no submission, know where to look, know when to act, to just be able to get in on those deadlines. So on top of doing the art, you know, doing the production and then doing the hustle. It's just like, uh, it's, it's one of many hats that, that I suspect you, you have handy. Yeah. It's, that's kind of how I, I'm like a Jack of, you know, Jack of many <laughs> trades, I guess, in a way. And, um, yeah, I think it, it all comes back down to that same, um, same at attitude of, you know, trying to improve your skills and learning new things and, doing it yourself. If, if nobody will do it for you, you got to do it for yourself kind of attitude. So, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a super valuable lesson. It like, you know, I can looking back at my own artistic journey, right? And I see how much time I spent waiting for someone else to decide to publish this, that, or the other thing, as opposed to like really going out there and 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 doing it, right? Getting things right. done. But um I want to take a look at a couple of your specific um, offerings here on your campaign, like uh, this early bird limited goodie bundle. Can you, uh, would you care to elaborate on this one in case anyone out there is <laughs> lightly on the fence? Yeah. So I, I tried to simplify my uh, rewards here. So it's not to overcomplicate, you know, all the different offerings. I think that's a big advantage. So for this one, so you get a signed volume. You get a uh, digital download and a limited edition sticker pack and bookmarks. And also for, I believe it's any reward that's over $20, you get a mention in the book, which is, I thought was really, really cool. And <laughs> back when I was starting a few years ago, um, when I was doing a lot of, or participating in a lot of crowdfunding, when I saw them like, oh, I get my name in the book, I'm going to go and con contribute to this one. <laughs> you know? So I was really into it. But um, for this one, since we've exceeded the, uh, the, the pledge already, the, you know, I think 140% now I'm even thinking of adding more freebie bundles into it. So I have to really assess, uh, the cost and things like that. I, I actually ended up buying like a sticker maker machine, whatever. I'm like, I'm, I want to make, learn how to make my own sticker now, you know? So I'm like, I'm going to give everybody free stickers. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. We'll have to discuss making stickers because I, I want to know what a sticker making machine looks like. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we have we have a question coming in from a young reader. Lisa's daughter wants to know why you like to creating stories. Uh, why do I like creating stories? I think it's because I I love reading stories. Uh, growing up, I was really into um, like I said, fairy tales, folk tales, all these different things. And in my family, we did, didn't really have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of like um, investment in fiction, that kind of thing. So like we didn't read picture books growing up. So those are things that I picked up later when I went to school. And that was in a way an escape for me, right? I would get into choose your own adventure books. And I had like, you know, a whole set. Um, and <laughs> so that was in a way for me to escape into a whole new world. So I think that's kind of the same thing that I want to impart. And so all the stories that I'm creating are stories that I would have wanted to read when I was growing up. That's awesome. Yeah, I just think about that. How many of us as artists are really trying to like, you know, nourish that inner child, right? That wanted that, that was always on the quest for that story, but was like, <laughs> I, but I want it like this, or I could do it a little bit better, right? Like the how many of us as kids were like, I could do draw that better? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. One of the one of the comics that um, Mr. Meanie burned <laughs> was actually I made a comic for uh, Indiana Jones. So it could have been Indiana Jones six or something, right? But I, I made a whole comics of of Indiana Jones, and um, yeah, it's just like creating my own fan art, I guess, back then, or you know, fan fiction. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, fan art has become such a huge, huge thing. I know um, yeah. I, I like to spend like because I'm a working artist, right? Usually if I'm drawing, it's because of there's some money or some kind of reward associated with it. Mm -hmm. Although to come back to um, something that you mentioned earlier about like mining for opportunities, I've definitely found it valuable to um, set a little bit of time or a little bit of my, my workload aside so that I can um, offer some free art to a project that I, that I'm a fan, a fan of. Right. That kind of like that kind of thing can kind of pay off unforeseen dividends in the future. But, um, but yeah, so sometimes if I'm not doing that, you know, I have a little extra time to, to have fun doing fan art, which I think is a great way to like, do artwork for one's own pleasure without having to like right. you know assign a, a price tag for it yeah but one, one of the things that i wanted to to get into is um uh zines right I, you've you've done those <laughs> so just like 
some of these, there's actually like a zine event happening here in a couple of weeks or sometime in August or something like that. And um, those are some really creative, uh, you know, where they cut everything out, paste it together and, you know, create a zine about anything. Like how do I cook noodles or something? And it's like, you know, a 10 page zine or a fanzine about how to make noodles. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I want to get into that because that looks really fun. <laughs> it is. It's 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 another booming thing. I think it's part of what's um the timing, right? Like it's so easy now to I mean you could just get such a nice quality printout from your at home printer or right. run down to the local stationery store and get your zine printed out there. It's like the barrier to entry is so low. I mean, you could even offer, you know, a PDF, right? Yeah. But um one thing I wanted to point out right coming back to your campaign is some of the more um physical items right like like in this case uh this perk can you elaborate a little bit about your limited edition signed print you're offering oh yeah so this one um i don't have the illustration for it yet but it's going to be an 11 by 17 uh print that's going to be signed so i'm only making a small amount of this um just for this campaign so i think this will be a really cool one that you can you know hang in your wall um so it'll be a, a nice piece of artwork so i'm very yeah. excited to see how this will come out and it's really impressive that you're going for like a tabloid size right because I, I know like having done campaigns myself right i've i'm really conscious of like shipping right so that, <laughs> yeah my um my prints are letter size so that I have like a uniform mailer that everything can fit in, you know? Right. So are you gonna yeah. have your tubes ready, branded? <laughs> Def that's definitely uh, one of the things that I was considering because I could, I have the capability of making a 13 by 19. Definitely the shipping is gonna be higher for something that, you know, it's gonna cost more for packing it and shipping it. And that's one of the big things that was uh, challenging for this campaign was that I wanted to offer more of an international uh, shipment capability, but I was looking at the prices for shipping. I'm like, nobody's gonna pay, you know, um, twice or more of what they're actually trying to purchase because of just for shipping. So it became a real, a real challenge pricing the shipping out. So for at least for this campaign, I just made it uh, within the uh, the local states, and you know, I could I could ship it much easier that way. But yeah, I d really wanted to offer it outside of the country. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a real trick that I think someone is going to, if someone can really figure out an effective workaround, that's like such an amazing niche because, you know, I yeah. think that many of us are always contending, even if it's just shipping to Canada, like once we've right. the U.S. borders, right, there's always some extra loops that you have to factor in. And that's right. just such a, a tricky challenge to like, yeah. how do, you know, I've got fans over there, but how do I get my stuff over there, you know? Right. Yeah, it is. It's a big challenge. <laughs> right. Which, right. All the more reason for, for the locals to kind of step up and help. You know, I've, I've found how through certain, I'm still trying to figure out how the magic works. Right. But there's almost a way to get like the local shipping, which more people are, you know, more, more, okay. Personally, more of my backers are low are local enough that they could almost help subsidize some of the overseas shipping mm -hmm. if the pricing works out. But it's, a, it's, you know, it's like part magic as well as math, you know, and you just cross your fingers that you're not pulling, you know, you're not like yeah. breaking the piggy bank to cover those last <laughs> minute shipments at the end of it. Yeah. And they got, you know, before I would, I would ship media mail and I think they removed media mail for international shipments. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's a bummer. Cause that would save you a lot of, uh, lot of money on the cost so now you have to ship it priority which is for international it's a lot so it's huge yeah it's yeah. you know while at the same time we're experiencing this boom in the availability of production there's like a major like tightening of the ability to get those things out there so it's a crazy time yeah. but i have a, a comment here that i want to share with you because we were talking about reading earlier right and marie says for marie Reading a graphic novel is like reading piano music. First, she reads the words, then she goes back and reads the images, and then it all comes together, like playing right and left hand together. That's pretty, uh, 
that's a pretty yeah. keen observation of one's own experience, but that's such a cool visual, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's very exciting. Yeah, I, I personally like to play around with um, how much I can communicate without the words. And then, okay, I, there needs to be a couple of words here to explain, you know, an idea or a concept. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, uh, maybe it's just the ones that I've come across, um, for at least for the younger, uh, you know, younger readers, a lot of the graphic novels are kind of screaming. Right. They're always like yelling at you like, hey, da, da, da. it's all action packed. Right. And it's to to feed that, you know, that desire in your brain to, you know, to to be triggered and to be like excited about something. Right. And I feel like especially you'll see this a lot in um, in manga where there's always like a quiet moment. Right. When you're reading, there's always a pause. There's like a, a little leaf that's just hanging by the tree. you know. And so you're like, wow, we need more of that where you just like kind of breathe a little bit. Not everything needs to be jumping and punching and kicking and, you know, all these action things. So I think those kinds of moments become become really precious, um, especially in books, especially for kids, because, you know, not yeah, like they need to be able to not be overly stimulated about every page that they turn. Everything is in full color. Everything is jumping and punching. So, yeah, I think it's it's a good contrast. It's, it's so true. And yet, and yet, you know, Dragon Ball Z or Naruto, they're like so renowned for their like, epic action right that like on a casual level you think that these books are just filled with action 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 but yeah. in reality right there's like such a delicate balance of choice right yeah yeah definitely and lisa says that's so well said ken she loves slower novels and graphic novels yeah yeah i i myself and i mean it takes time to draw them but i i definitely like to you know, take a moment and create like a big vista for someone to just stop and get lost in. You know, it might be like a huge double page vista and then an inset panel where the conversation is happening, right? But I want people to just mm -hmm. see the whole thing. But um, yeah. it's one of the few things you can do with comics, right? Is like play on those levels, you know? Right, right. I mean, it's it's been a long time since there was there's been like a fully silent movie that I could think of, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if they're going to be taking that kind of risk. Well, so then here's my question. When Pixar calls you and says, we want to do a Pixar adaptation of Petro, are you going to, you know, and they, they you know, are, are you going to enter discussions as to who the voice actor is going to be? Or are you going to insist that it be Pixar's first 100% silent movie? Oh, that would be cool if they're able to to go with that. Um was the dinosaur, was that Pixar or was that uh, DreamWorks, the the dinosaur movie? You know, I, I think they've both done dinosaur movies. So yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, but there's that one, the good dinosaur, which yeah. I never caught, right? That's a, that's a Pixar piece. Is it? Okay. Yeah. But I yeah, was that, I, I didn't catch that one. So I don't know if that was a uh, fully silent. The last dinosaur movie that I saw was silent was, uh, was Caveman starring Ringo Starr, and I was, I was very young when when that movie came out. Yeah. What What's the so There's a now we're getting into the dinosaur tangent here. There's sorry about that. There's that that dinosaur one on HBO, and that's obviously fully silent because it's the caveman and a dinosaur. A T. Oh, you that's a primal. Are you thinking yeah. of? Yeah. There's obviously oh, yeah. no one there. It's kind of like a samurai Jack in a way where everything is mostly quiet, right? So, yeah, same same producer, same animator as the Samurai right. Jack Studio yeah. Primal, yeah. love it. But we've uh, we've certainly we've certainly <laughs> digressed <laughs> from what we're here to discuss, which is Petro. Actually, I'm going to remove this and and come back to our main um our main screen because I want to see how well your campaign is doing up to the very moment. But for, oh, you know what I found here? I want folks to know that um, you're also, your work is also online, right? I want to, before we we uh, end, because, you know, can you believe it's been an hour already? Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so I want folks to know, right, that they could find you on Instagram and other socials. And is that the handle you use for all yep. such things? 
such you items. Got it. Life is easier when you just have one handle. <laughs> at yeah, board. this this is true. And then if that's not enough, this is also your your website, yep. right? Where folks can find you. And I I was taking a look at um at your website. I'm a little jealous. I have to I have to do some serious updating of my own, having seen what you've got out there. Oh, thank you. It hasn't Correct. been updated in a long time, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, I mean, this this might have to do with your your computer survey because it's a pretty sweet looking website, if I do say so myself. And um, yeah, and then there it is. Look at this. Look at this catalog of books. Very very cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's definitely needs to be. I used to do more. Um, I used to do book reviews of uh, coffee table books. So uh, I would post it on YouTube and post it on my website. Um, but that is expensive. <laughs> the, the, the time, uh, it does uh, add up. But uh, we have a few uh, a few well wishes from Lisa as we're as Thanks, we're ending Lisa. things. Thanks, Ken. And uh, a thanks to me. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us. We've been here for a full hour, um, and it's been it's been it went by so fast. There's still I could really we didn't even get to start talking about mythical monsters, which I really wanted to like All right. take it. And also, I wanted to to share with you that where I come from in Puerto Rico, there's also a a folk tale of a character who's called Juan Bobo which sounds very sim similar in the sense that ah. he's always known for his antics of like trying to finish work early. And, yeah. you know, I'm going to set this thing up that'll do the work for me. How about and then that? I can go take a nap, <laughs> right? And it's just like, oh, where did I hear someone mention a character like that? Yeah. Also named Juan. I got to I gotta look that up. That's funny. I guess the, yeah. the, it's a universal thing. <laughs> right. The, the, the universal, right? The universal Juan. Yeah. But, uh. But that's just something I had to share with you because I, I remember you mentioning that and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Some some things truly, like Mr. Meany, some things truly are universal. Right. <laughs> but, um, well, we're at the, the one hour and two minute mark. So what I would like to do is close out with your video one last time. But... um. Before I do that, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to, you know, anything that has been left unsaid, anything else you'd like to communicate to the, the folks watching or the folks who will come across this video in the future during a replay? Yeah, I just wanted to say again, first of all, thanks again, Patrick, for hosting this and uh, Kid, Kid Comics Unite. You guys are awesome for putting all the videos online on YouTube, sharing your knowledge. Uh, it, it's so invaluable to people like myself and people who are just coming up and want to learn about uh, creating comics and graphic novels. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, to everyone else who have seen this video, um, please support the campaign, crowdfunder.com slash Petro book. Yep. The link is there right there. Is. So thanks again. I hope that the uh, story of Petro resonates with you and that you will support the book and also support me in any other way you can follow me on all the socials send me a message i get a lot of people asking me about how to get into making comics or my you know my son wants to learn about comics what direction to go that kind of thing and you know when i find the time i try to reply back to everyone and help out and so and for all those who have already supported thank you so much for making this campaign a successful look looks like we're at 140 percent and maybe if we reach 200%, I'll throw in something extra bonus in there. So let's keep on plugging away and making this campaign happen. And uh, thanks also to crowdfunder.com for putting this event together. And so make sure to go to their website uh, to check out all the other campaigns. This morning I was on there and I was like, oh, this looks cool. I'll you know help out a little bit on this campaign. I'll help out on that. So you know, try to give back a little bit as well. So let's, you know, let's help each other out and make the community uh, fruitful and make it all happen. 
Agreed. I'll 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 just echo those sentiments and then press play here. Hey everyone, how's it going? Ken Lamug here, author and illustrator. Kamusta na po mga kababayan? And thanks for checking out the crowdfunding campaign for Petro book number two. So the story of Petro is about this boy who would often get into trouble because of his laziness. He tried to do a specific task, but he'd try to do a shortcut and he would dig himself deeper into problems. But through his curiosity, his ingenuity, creativity, and sometimes the kindness of his heart, he's able to find ways out of these problems and at the same time, helping those people around him. Ever since I was a child, I've always wanted to create my own story that's based on the Filipino culture. Petro's world is magical and filled with many creatures and characters from Filipino folk tales and mythologies. And these are the same stories that I grew up in and I always wanted to share them with the world. The choice of making Petro a wordless graphic novel was a conscious one. I wanted the reader to sit and pause at each picture and really be immersed and absorb the world in every page and illustration that they're in. I've received a lot of positive feedback from teachers who use the Petro books as a text for hesitant readers. In 2020, Petro and the Fleeking was actually selected to represent Nevada at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, we were all stuck at home in 2020, but it was still a great honor to be selected to be able to share the story of Petro and the Filipino culture to the world. So thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Please read the campaign description below. Check out some of the rewards. Maybe something in there resonates with you. I hope that you share this campaign with your friends and I hope that you join us on the Petro book number two adventure. Thank you so much. See you soon.